alumni about their professional experiences and how we can elevate the professional skills, talents, and contributions of women in the workplace. Um, so like Emily said, I'm just going to read their bios. They're all very distinguished. Um, so I'll get to it. Our first panelist is Angela C. Baker. Um, Angela graduated from Townsend University with an undergraduate degree in organizational psychology and earned a graduate degree from Marymount in human resources development. She previously served as an adjunct professor um, at university at University of Marymount University College. That was a mouthful, I apologize. <laughs> um, now University of Marymount Global Campus and has 25 years of human resource experience in the healthcare sector. The last 10 years, her work has focused, focused on the nonprofit arena and she offers HR consulting and training for many organizations in George, Virginia and Maryland. Um, Georgia, I believe. Um, welcome, Angela. Um, our next panelist is Laura Janjuli. Um, Laura is currently um, serving as the Senior Vice President and Chief Human Resources Officer at Caliber, um, which is responsible, and she's responsible for managing all aspects of human resources, as well as payroll administration and corporate security for Caliber. In this role, Laura is a member of the corporate leadership team and advises the board of directors and corporate officers on a number of human resources matters, including risk management, compensation and benefits, and employee development and executive coaching, to name a few. Laura has over 20 years of experience in human capital management with proven success developing programs to achieve corporate goals. She also has experience creating and managing HR programs and policies for a dispersed um, workforce to include international employees and in out of war zones. Um, Laura holds a senior professional professional and human resources, senior certified professional, and a strategic HR business partner certification and holds a Bachelor of Arts in Liberal Arts from Marymount University. She is currently enrolled at Cornell University in the Executive Master's Human Resources Program. Thank you for being here, Laura. Next up, and our final panelist is Pamela Roberts. Pamela M. Roberts is the Director um, of Diversity and Inclusion for the Mission System Sector, an $11 billion organization with 23,000 employees in 50 states and 21 countries. Oh my goodness. Um, in this role, she designs, develops, and implements diversity and inclusion strategies, initiatives, and programs to attract, retain, and promote a, a a diverse workforce, goodness. As the Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Ms. Roberts leads the Mission Systems Executive Diversity and Inclusion Leadership Council. Additionally, she leads the sector's Employee Resource Group Council and oversees the strategic direction of over 150 chapters of employee resource groups across the US, including seven international chapters. In her previous role at Northrop Grumman Corporation, Ms. Roberts served in a similar capacity as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion for the Information System sector, in which she was instrumental in the establishment and implementation of sector-wide programs such as Employee Resources Groups, a Leadership Acceleration Initiative sector, and Div Division Diversity Councils training and branding initiatives. With more than 30 years of work experience at Fortune 100 companies, Ms. Roberts has served in numerous human resource positions and increasing responsibility. She has proven a proven track record of increasing employee engagement through the development and implementation of various human resource policies, practices, and procedures that align and supported with business objectives. Ms. Roberts has been a guest speaker at various industry forums where she addressed topics on diversity, culture, um, executive presence, and transgender inclusion. Ms. Roberts has also named, um, as, was also named as a thought leader and featured in Profiles in Diversity Journal in April 2010 for her position on making diversity part of a company's DNA, a distinguished recognition that she cherish, cherishes. Ms. Roberts has a bachelor's degree in business administration with a concentration in marketing from Howard University in Washington, DC. In addition, she holds a master's degree in human resources management from Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia, and she is certified Six Sigma Green Belt. So thank you for joining us, Ms. Roberts. 
Alrighty, and with all of that information, now you know they're overqualified to be speaking to us today. Um, and I'm just gonna kick it off with a few questions that we have. Um, a reminder, if you have a question, we have the Q&A um, function that you can ask and we'll um, save those for the end. The first question that I have for you all is a little bit of an icebreaker one. Um, and since this is a woman-led panel, I felt that this was a little bit appropriate. What is your current TV show that is women-led that you cannot stop watching? It's a hard one. You know, I, I'll, I think I, I think this is, I think they call them Name That Tune now. Name That Tune used to be something back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, but now they have it, and Marriott, Meredith Venera, Ver Vera, That's 25 yeah. words or less. That's, that's right. what I was yes. going to say. Yes. <laughs> that's it. Angelique Carvin, 25 yes. words or less. Yes. That's my favorite yes. as well. She drives that one, and I love it. <laughs> that's what I can think of, because I do want <laughs> That one, or what's the one with Whoopi Goldberg? Oh, yeah. The View. The talk show. The talk show, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good one. Yep. Any other takers? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, the 25 words or less. I've, I've got a, a um, I like Tamron Hall. She's been, uh, she's a new um, minority woman on the scene on a talk show. This is her first year, I think, or second year, actually. Her first year, she won an Emmy. So she's doing very well. Um, and so I like to follow her show as well. Guess I'm going to go a little old school. I can't miss the Today Show every morning with Savannah and Hoda. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> can't go wrong. Can't go wrong with that one. Can't go wrong. <laughs> all righty. Thank you all. Um, so the first question is: How did your education at Marymount University help you succeed? You want to pick someone first, or we just uh, going to jump in? And jump in. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Angela Baker. I, for some reason, didn't include in my bio that I currently work for the Girl Scouts nation's capital. Um, we're the largest Girl Scout council in the country. Um, there are 111 councils that exist in the United States, and we are the largest. We service over 88,000 members. Uh, sorry, I had to add that little piece to it because I'm thinking I didn't put in with my current job. So I currently work. I've been there for five years. Absolutely love it. Um, I think my master's in uh, and human resources just solidified um, my expertise in, in human resources. Um, I think it also um, broadened my, my, my thought process around human resources because, because I always thought looking at it more in a generalist standpoint versus a specialist uh, was important for me. So I wanted to kind of be a jack of all trades. Um, and so that's what it, it helped me. I obtained my master's in the 80s, back when human resources was isn't very popular for women. It was a very male dominated uh, industry at that time. So to, to get in front of uh, a CEO or a vice president, um, you know, a master's degree was very helpful. And so it, it really uh, solidified that for me. Oh, I see probably with, I beat, beat you to the buzzer. <laughs> So Laura G and Julie, um, you know, as, as uh, Daniela said, I got my bachelor's degree at Marymount. Um, and so for me, I found the course content was incredibly relevant. Um, I thought the instructors um, provided real life scenarios. I could have, I could immediately go back and apply. I was going to school at the same time that I was already working in human resources. And so I found that very applicable. Um, you know, there were, of course, were some classes where I kind of rolled my eyes, but, you know, for the most part, um, I felt like, you know, at the time, every time I finished a class, I thought, wow, I learned something more. And as Angela said, it really solidified that this was the career that I wanted to go into. I thought it did a great job of really highlighting what I was getting myself in for. And I'll just obviously go and jump in, obviously last. And I wanna first of all say thank you to Marymount University for the invitation. And also it's a pleasure to be on this panel, both with you, Angela and Laura. So thank you very much. Um, you know, when I, when I thought about the question, one of the things I thought about was, you know, earning a college degree is, is really such an important step um, in one's life. It's really central part of your life. 
you go to college, you get a job, you buy a house, you raise a family. It may not be that simple, but it does start with a college, educate, a college education. And earning a degree from Marymount for me came down to a, a couple of things, developing some skills that I needed, um, increasing my knowledge base and opening up opportunities that I would not have had otherwise. Um, and a lot of it had to do, as Laura said, had to do professionally for me, for the relationships that I built and I cultivated, particularly with the professors. Um, one professor who I cultivated really good, fighting back and forth on stuff. Actually, he gave me a job where I work now <laughs> back in 91 or 92. Um, but it, I also had the opportunity to cultivate some uh, relationships with my classmates. And so the bottom line for me is that the education, my education at Marymount University really was a, a key contributor to my success. These are good answers. I like these. And Laura, I'm sure you are not the only one that has had, you know, a little bit of an eye roll with some classes, but they're all, they're all useful, right? Um, so the, thank you for sure. those answers. <laughs> the second yeah. question we have is, um, what are the best examples of positive change in the workplace that you have noticed in the past five years? Uh, I don't mind going ahead and starting with that. Um, you know, today the notion um, that employees can um, not work from their home is, is different, right? Um, unless you're obviously in a job where uh, you really need to be at your specific location, like if you're in a manufacturing facility, for example. But in this techni technically driven world that we're in now, product productivity has never been higher. Um, I would say that processes have never been more operationally efficient and um, solving customer problems 24 seven, um, I guess really anywhere in the world. Um, has been easier. So with this changing workforce and I would say with the changing demographics of organizations who are really truly trying to attract and retain the best talent, um, there are many forces that play um, at dramatically impacting overall employee experience. And so for example, the one thing, you know, your question uh, again was some examples of some positive changes um, I noticed how back in June, I think it was, yeah, June of 2020 last year, IBM, for example, they told 75,000 of their employees to work from home permanently. And then Google um, asked their employees or advised their employees that they can work at home until summer of 20, 2021, which is this summer. A lot of it obviously had to do with the pandemic, some of it also had to do with the unrest that happened across our country over the last year. Um, but though that's one example, I also saw uh, dress codes being a little relaxed. Before we got on this, we were talking about what we were wearing. <laughs> you know, all uh, I'm wearing under this, I'm wearing uh, on my bottom, I'm wearing um, sweatpants because I could do that. <laughs> um, and then I've seen positive changes relative to employee health benefits, uh, employee assistance programs, a lot of different types of tr uh, uh, training as well for women or people of color or really just advancing into a variety of different cohorts. And I see that as it improves morale, it improves employee satisfaction, um, and it improves um, employee retention. So um, I think those are the positive things that have happened that I see regularly, not within the company that I work in, but in various companies. I think um, from uh, another HR perspective, definitely the, um, instituting DEI in the organizations, we're seeing lots of intent, intentional programs around diver, uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity. I think that's important. I think mindfulness um, for 
for employees looking at and taking care of the entire employee, the whole employees, so to speak, versus their um, just have, having a personnel file. And back in the day, we used to be called personnel. And you just kind of push the paper and, and onboarded the person and now actually uh, looking at that person as a human being and taking care of that person internally as well as externally as it relates to productivity and, and work performance. Yeah, and I think all that I would add here is a, a scene of a real increase in authenticity, right? Especially from a leadership level, right? There seems to be those, that barriers coming down between the boss and the employees, right? You know, and that leaders are being more authentic and employees are encouraged to be more authentic in the office as well, that you don't have to hide a little bit of what Angela was just saying, you know, wholeness, right? That we understand that you, you know, might be a parent and that you're a spouse or a caregiver. And that mentions you and you can bring that. I think we see two Pamela Roberts on the on the call. Yeah, I think I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think she can come off of mute, I mean, off of the, um, of showing her screen. She may not be able to hear, but we can keep going. <laughs> apologies, apologies for that. Apologies. All righty. Um, okay, thank you for those answers. Um, the third question that we have, and this one I am especially interested to hear because I'm about to enter the workforce. Um, how can women negotiate a higher salary? Yeah, I'll start. Um, you know, I think really you need to do your homework, right? I mean, if you're going to go into any negotiation, you need to know what your worth is. You need to know what the market is. Um, pay is right, you know, understand if what you're asking for what you're expecting is um, in line with with your peers and in line with the industry or, or are you wishful thinking right. Um, and, and I think also it's important as 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 women and, and just you know students come out into the workforce is to really look at what that total package is that's being offered from the employer. We get so focused on the base salary. And I understand I was there, you know, we all were there, right? Well, at, at one point when you could care less what the retirement benefit was, right? You want more compensation. Um, but you would be surprised at some of the other benefits that go into your total compensation package, whether that's PTO, whether that's professional development, whether that is tuition reimbursement, you know, I mean, right now you're probably not thinking you want to go back to school, but you never know, right? And so when you factor all of those things in, um, that also allows you to really think about what's non-negotiable for you in terms of what you want and what's negotiable for you. Um, because, you know, I will tell you over the years I've learned there is no amount of money that will keep someone at a bad job or working for a bad boss, right? And so it's not all about the actual dollars and cents. You need to think about what's the culture of the company and where do you see your opportunity there? Okay, I, I'll go ahead and add to that. Um, you know, when I thought about this question, the first thing that came to my mind was um, that women need to learn how to negotiate uh, effectively, right? They need to understand what negotiating is all about. What are those skills? Because the reality is that we negotiate every day in our organizations. You negotiate with your classmates as well. You negotiate ideas. You know, negotiate projects, deadlines, how something's going to be formatted. So it's something you already do. But I recognize the fact that it really can be an intimidating type of conversation, right? And women are more reluctant to broach that topic. Um, I did read a topic um, or an article from Robert Half where they interviewed about 2,800 workers 
about their last job offer. And 46% of the women at, um, were asked, 46% of women, I think they did not ask for more money compared to 66% of men. Why is that? Mm-hmm. Why is that? We got better. Mm-hmm. Um, and so salary negotiation is an area where women really lack some confidence, but we really should do better than in that. And that's what forums like this does. It helps to bring that confidence up because there's a fear of rejection maybe. There might be lack of preparation. So that's important, doing your homework as Laura was uh, talking about and not knowing how to ask that. So doing your homework is number one, uh, but realizing what your value is. And so there are a variety of tools out there that can talk a little bit about um, your, the position that you're either in or you're trying to go to. So you can try to understand what your value is. What's the cost of living where you work? And put your business case together. Put your list of accomplishments out there. What's it, what things have you done successful? What things have you saved the company, saved your at the school? What are some of the programs? Activity gains. What are some of the um, customer feedback that's getting? You know, and there's also an ideal time of doing this as well. Um, it could be number one, right after an initial offer, or right after you just hit a home run. I say home run because I'm a big baseball fan, and mm. then you're on right now. Oh my! <laughs> if you're all, you're in this area, so if you're that fan, mm-hmm. um, you just completed some successful project. But being able to communicate that confidence confidently is extremely important and not being scared. But there is always a downside. What if they say, whoever you're asking us to, they say no. Make sure you have a backup plan. Mm-hmm. And you might say, fine, you're not going to give me an extra $30,000, but I want two extra weeks of vacation. Do that research as well. Help yourself to get where you want. And then they're going to know. This person is not to be played with. That's what you want to make sure when you walk out the door. Oh, well, well, this is the worst going last, right? Because everything <laughs> that I said was everything that was in my mind, right? You know, any HR person is going to always tell you to look at total comp, right? You're going to always look at total compensation. Again, know your value. Ask for what you want. Um, Michelle Obama always says, if you are not going to use your voice, you should get up from the table. So use your voice, speak, say what you want. Um, sell yourself, say what you're going to bring to the table with respect to outcomes that you could potentially offer for the organization. Um, as Pamela was talking about success that you've had in, in projects at school, if you don't have a lot of work experience, talk about success that you've had, in, you know, whether it's relationship building, whether it's um, um, metrics that you can show uh, that it has some level of improvement. So I think that's important in not and showing and being confident and not being afraid. Um, my mom always told me the worst they could say is no, right? But you won't know if you don't ask. So ask. I'm over here taking notes. <laughs> I'm listening and I'm definitely going to be doing this when, when the time comes. Um, the next question that we have is, have you noticed any new incentives and in job descriptions to attract women to roles? I, I, I'm, th- I'm starting to see more, uh, more general uh, gender neutral pronouns being used. Um, I think more work life balance uh, language in for not just for women for for employees as a whole. Um, I think those are great incentives for staff. The the flexibility to not have to have a job in DC and live in DC. Uh, you can you don't and the commute. Everyone knows who lives in this metropolitan area. Commuting is is very very. Um, fun. So <laughs> if you could avoid that and have a, a remote position, I think being able to offer those type of perks and, and include that this is a 100% remote position or this is a 90% remote position, I think are, is very attractive uh, to our new generation as, as they're coming out into the work world and for, um, for um, employees who are looking for positions. Um. 
I actually don't have anything additional to add because <laughs> Angela said exactly what I was going to say. So um, it's right in line with my thought process and actually right in line with the organization that I work with as well. Thank you. Um, the next question that we have is how can women in the workplace make their mark? Well, you know, what, when I saw this question, I thought there's a part of me that kind of cringed when I saw it, right? Because why as a woman do I have to make my mark, you know? And then I thought, well, calm down, Laura, it's a woman's panel, you know? But, you know, so, I mean, I, I think, and I think that that's the key, right? Is you can't be afraid to speak up, right? I mean, is when Pamela and Angela were talking about negotiations, I think they were spot on that, you know, for so often, uh, women are are taught or we see that we're supposed to be nice. We're supposed to be, um, you know, just, just friendly, right? We're not supposed to ask for what we want or demand what we want, right? And if we do, we get labels, right? I and mean, we all know what those labels are, right? And so, and so we don't want that label. And so we sit in the corner, right? And so I would say, don't be afraid to speak up, right? I mean, to, to engage when you can, again, to always do your homework, right? If you're going to speak up, have something to say, right? Make sure that you're bringing something to the conversation um, and, and that you're, and remember, they hired you, right? They want you, right? They had other, they had other options. I guarantee you they did, right? And they chose you, right? And so bring yourself to the office and bring yourself to the opportunities um, and do what you can, you know, be polite, be professional. You don't have to go in there and break glass and be hard charging, but that also doesn't mean that you have to shrink in the corner because someone, you know, isn't giving you a turn, right? Take, take your turn. That's what I would say. Um, I'll just add by, um, I totally agree with everything that Laura, Laura said there. Um, but you could also make your mark by working through others. And this is how I, this is what I mean. Number one, get yourself a mentor. Mentors are critical, critical to your development, critical to your growth. But even more important than a mentor is a sponsor. Because there's a difference between a mentor and a sponsor. And a sponsor is someone essentially, it's like a mentor, but what is different from them is they're talking about you when you're not even in the room. And that's where you're going to be making your mark through a sponsor. So, and it's not, I've, I've heard some organizations saying, oh, we have a sponsorship program. That's fine. But to me, a sponsor is developed after a long engaged relationship with a mentor, it, it, it evolves into a sponsor. And so that's when that's gonna, your mark is gonna be made. One of the ways your mark is gonna be made. The second area where your mark is gonna be, be made is through networking. How you network, when you network, who are you networking, networking with? You also make your mark by going above and beyond what your current roles and responsibilities are doing. Hatch onto that, do that special project that nobody else wants to do. Will it take you some late nights? Will it take you potentially some evenings? But it might, but the outcome is that you're gonna be in a better place because people are gonna say, you know what? That Angela, that Laura, they're really something else. They did these other things that helped save us some money. They did it with a smile and as a result, we're better off as a result, as a result of what they've done. And so there's one thing I usually, um, and two other things I want to say is number one is how you show up. Are you showing up with some confidence? Even if you don't know what you don't know, be confident. You can always go figure it out. Because I can promise you this, the men, they figure it out. So can we. So make sure you're thinking along the way. And when I say think, T is uh, whatever you say, is it true? H is for helpful. Is it helpful what you're saying? I is for inspiring. Are you being inspiring? Not just to your boss, your organization, but to your colleagues. N is for, is it necessary what you're going to say? 
And then finally, Kay, going back to what Laura's saying, are you being kind? You should be kind. We should all be kind. If we learned nothing else over this last year with the unrest that's happening across the country, across our nation, across our United States, there's a lot more kindness that needs to happen. So don't ever forget that, in my opinion. That would help make you a genuine, authentic, I can't remember who's talked about authenticity, with whether it was Angela or, or Laura, but that is critically important to help to, de to develop you and really to develop your personal brand. I get goose pimples when I listen to other HR professionals because we're all so on the same page and all very passionate about what we do. I, I definitely co-sign everything Laura and uh, Pamela said uh, about making your mark. And I'll just add this last piece. Don't forget about the other person you want to bring up with you. Don't just, don't just kind of sit in your success. Think about that woman that you can help, that you can help mentor, that you can bring along with you as well. Bravo. That's like the tagline of a good movie. Great. I'm glad this is recorded. Someone can use that. Um, and don't be surprised when you see Daniela Alexander hop in on your, um, your LinkedIn inbox to build the network. Um, the next question that we have um, is how do you expect the workplace to change over the next five years to encourage more women into work? Well, I, th I think um, we've probably touched on that a little bit. I think remote working is here to stay, right? I think we realized, uh, you know, at our organization where I currently work, we were uh, piloting a telework program. We just kind of started into telework and we went from a pilot straight into 100% telework. And oh my gosh, we were successful. We were effective. We were productive. So I think uh, telework is definitely something that's going to continue to evolve um, within organizations. Again, I think the not having to live in the state in which you work, uh, not having to be here. Um, I also think um, um, contractors are going to kind of come back on the scene a little bit. I think as organizations are looking at um, the telework, I don't need a conference room anymore. I don't need large office space anymore. You know, we can do everything. We can have our meeting just like this via Zoom, and we can be all over the country, all over the world. Um, so I think those kind of changes are, are definitely uh, coming about and here to stay. Yeah, and I would add to that, um, that, that also, you know, we keep hearing about the, the, the women that are leaving the workforce in dramatic numbers over the last year because of the pandemic and because of the unrest, right? And so we, we're already having conversations in this HR level of how do we bring them back to the workplace, right? How do we get them back into work? And so talking about, you know, dedicated internship programs, they're going to be, you know, focused on, on that, that female, that woman that wants to return back to the workforce that's been out for whatever reason, right? I also think that we're starting to see an emphasis on what are those, um, knowledge, skills, and abilities that you have already, right, that you can bring to the table, that you can bring to the job, um, and what are the demonstrated successes that you have, and how can we, how can we parlay that into what I need for you in your work, right? It's not necessarily anymore about what have you been doing for the last two years from a business perspective, right, but what are those knowledge, skills, and abilities that you've gained that I need you to have in, in your role here when, as you come back into the workforce, and then, you know, as, as we've talked about, just this idea of flexibility and not just the notion that you can work from wherever, but that you can work whenever, right? So if you need to take an hour off in the middle of the day to go, you know, to your child's school or to take your a parent to the doctors or what have you, right? That there's no longer this, I shouldn't say no longer, it's starting to become no longer that rigid nine to five mentality that we used to have, you know? So if I need to start my day at 10 because I need to drop my kids off at school, that's okay because I'm going to be on a little bit later in the evening and vice versa, right? Or if I need to take a big block of time out in the middle of the day, um, I'm starting to see that flexibility as well. Well, again, um, um, in the words of uh, Angela Baker, going third, you can't always find something new to talk about, but there's just one other thing I, I, I thought about um, that might be just a little bit different um, as if it works to the workplace um, change over the next five years. 
Um, I'm not sure if anybody saw last night, CNN had a, uh, they had all of the infectious disease doctors, Dr. Fauci and a whole bunch of those doctors on last night. And towards the end of the programming, they showed this robot that was going around, I guess, assessing and evaluating patients. And so the thing that I thought about, as opposed to potentially doctors, like we know now when we go to the doctor. So what's going to, the thing I thought that might be just a little bit different is as the change in the workplace over the next five, maybe even 10 years might be AI, artificial intelligence, um, avatars, are they, are, those are smart, smart machines. I mean, we see now, I don't need to call anybody and talk to somebody on the phone if I want them to do, to deliver. I like um, Maggiano's, I like Italian food. I just go online. Next thing I know, I have my ravioli here at my house. So with artificial intelligence, with avatars out there being our new coworkers, one of the things that I would highly recommend for everybody to do is as you are matriculating in your studies, do some research on the field that you want to do, be in, and see if there is any future thought, future um, thinking about how is this job that I want going to change over the next five to 10 years? Because you might need to do some re retooling of your skills. That's for all of us, right? That's just the, the society that we're the, the size society that we're into in today. Um, whoever thought that there would be a plane that would fly? You know, people back way before we were here, there's no plane gonna go up in there. Oh, not only are there planes, there's helicopters and there's rockets. So think about when I think about the change of the workforce, which Daniela, that was your question. I think about artificial intelligence and how it can impact every single one of us as we move forward in our careers. Thank you for those responses. Um, the next question that we have um, is, have you noticed a trend towards a more diverse recruitment policy from hiring managers? Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would say generally speaking, yes. Um, I will relate this more to my company. I would say that we are actually in the process of reviewing that, right? Of of looking to see if there are any unintended and unconscious biases in the way that we are hiring and the requisitions that we're posting, right? In the in the interview panels that we hold, right? You know, um, you know that we we might not um, understand that if a if a minority is coming to to interview and everyone interviewing them is, is Caucasian, right? What, what message does that send or vice versa, right? So we're trying to be intentional in how we're doing this. Um, you know, even talking about the questions that we're asking, right? You know, again, I mean, just a, a true, you know, bottoms up, sideways, any which way to look at, at how that process is, how can we be more inclusive? Um, and then once they join the company, then how can we ensure onboarding? How can we ensure that they continue to feel welcome, that they're included, that, that they have an opportunity to succeed? Um, you know, so we're, we're really looking at it, but I would tell you um, right now, if you probably looked at our website, you would, you would say that we haven't done a lot, but I promise, you know, we almost need that, you know, um, work in progress banner on, on the career site, right, for, for Caliber, but, but we're getting there. And, and I think, I think a lot of, a lot of companies um, are, are in that space. You know, Laura, I think uh, education is is key for our organizations as we move through our, our times. You know, in HR, we've always been cognizant of equality uh, and things. And now, as you stated and using your word intentional, you know, having doing an intentional outreach to uh, to organizations, minority organizations, different social uh, economic groups, um, speaking at different uh, locations so that we're being more intentional in our outreach versus indeed or idealists who just it's just kind of out there, you know, doing things that are intentional. But I think educating your organization um, around a diversity, equity, and inclusion, around uh, looking at the entire employee versus where they went to school or 
you know, anything in specific, um, I think is going to be key in starting that process. I think a lot of our organizations are work in progress, right? I think we all need to have that banner <laughs> as we continue to work through and, and, and navigate through this. But I, I think we're going in a positive manner. I think people are talking about it. People are open to it. Organizations and leadership needs to stay open to it. Um, and so hopefully you want to work for an organization that is definitely open to it. Um, so that's as, as you interview for your right fit, just as much as they're interviewing you, you need to be interviewing that organization. You need to make sure that that organization is a fit for you and that they are inclusive, that they, they do, that they have employee engagement activities, that they're not just uh, talking the talk, that they're walking the walk. Angela and Laura, again, took everything I was going to say. So thanks for reading my notes. <laughs> but uh, I think the only two things that I can add, because it's a similar, everything is similar to at my location, is um, the additional thing is that we're having diverse panels. So those interviews are, um, the panels are, are diverse as well. Um, that's number one. And then the other thing that we are doing to help is utilizing our employee resource groups. Those are employees who come together. They have some common interests. Some of them are um, pulled together because of their variety of their ethnicity. Some are not ethnicity based, um, but they help with um, the recruiting and hiring efforts, whether we go to a conference or whether it's even internal within our company, because you're still hiring people. They want to move around. So people want to know, is that a good place for me to go work? Is it good to work for Angela? Is it good to work for Laura? I can tell you right now, yes, just by meeting them right now, they're great women to work for. But um, it is all about not just the individuals who have the hat of talent acquisition on, everybody in the company has to have that hat of talent acquisition on to help to gain the workforce that you want for the organization. Thank you. Um, it's very reassuring to, you know, hear that organizations and companies are kind of all under construction and everyone is making a more conscious effort to, you know, pull in the people of color and whatnot. So that's a positive. We can add that on the positive list. Um, our last question for this is what is the best piece of career advice you have ever received? No, Pamela, go Pamela, ahead. Pamela, you go first. Yeah, I was going to say I'm saying the same thing. <laughs> Pamela, you go first. I'll go first. I'll go first. Okay, I'll be quick because I'm looking at the time here. And I can, you know, I've been in the workforce for about 30 years now. And so there's advice that you can gain from a variety of people, from a variety of experiences. And when I looked at that question, I was like, there's so much, right? And so what it are the two things that boil down to me, particularly if I was still at Marymount and I was going to graduate soon. I think, Danielle, I think you're graduating soon. The two top things to me are your ability to effectively network. You've got to be able to have conversations with people. That doesn't mean that you can't, you could can be an introvert. You can still be able to conversate and, and communicate with people, right? That's important. But the second most important thing, and I just happen to do this, have this on my book table here. You have to read. These are various books. You have to read. I am reading five books at once. That's not good because I'm mixing up stuff, right? But in order to increase your skill set, in order to um, impact somebody understanding what your personal brand is, in order for some for you to effectively negotiate your salary, we were talking about the salary negotiation earlier, you have got to read. It doesn't mean it has to be a book. I just like books. I'm a little old school like that. I like turning the pages. But find a website where you can download some white papers about your specific field and make sure you are continuously reading that. Make sure you are continuously understanding what's one, two, three steps ahead of you. Because what you, the bottom line is you want to be seen as a valued employee to the organization. When you say something that is, oh, this is you know what I realized or out of research I found two years down the pipe, what's gonna happen, we're not there, we need to move forward with that. They will look at you as a 
say brilliant and that's what you want. And you are brilliant. You wouldn't, anyone who goes to Marymount, as far as I'm concerned, is brilliant. I think everybody can agree with that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Well, I think um, uh, the best career advice I, I received was to be true to yourself. Know yourself. Um, you have to know yourself, be comfortable with yourself, love yourself, to be able to negotiate anywhere, to be able to fit in and be successful anywhere. And I'm saying, you know, not being hard, you know, we're hard on ourselves, you know, we're hard on our mistakes. We want to be perfect. We want to do everything just right, but we're going to make mistakes. We're going to have to forgive ourselves. We're going to have to learn from these mistakes and move on and grow from them. But I think it's important to know what you like, what you don't like, what you want, what you don't want, um, being true to that. Uh, and not just trying to join this organization because they offered me a fat salary, but you know they don't have the culture that I want to work in. Just trying to fit in, just so being true and, and knowing yourself. Um, the last piece of it is make a decision. Um, I remember my first regional HR job. I was very young, very green, for lack of a better word. And and uh, I remember my vice president of HR telling me, Angela, if you can't reach me and something needs to happen, I need you to make a decision. Well, what if it's the wrong? Make a decision. If it's the wrong decision, you're going to learn from that mistake and grow from that. And then, but you're going to be confident that you can make a decision. So making a decision. I'm taking some career advice notes here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I would, I would just add um, for me, a same thing, you know, I, I really thought about this a lot and thought, oh my goodness, how do you, how do you pick one? Right. But I, I think for me, what's had a really big impact is assume positive intent, right. Until proven otherwise, assume the person who's sending you an email, calling you, asking you a question in a meeting. They're not doing it to be malicious. They're not trying to, you know, throw you under the bus, right? You know, um, assume positive intent and you would be surprised at how quickly that de-escalates a situation, especially in human resources, right? People come to us with very emotional issues. Um, and so to assume that the person who's asking the question or coming to you is doing it from a good place automatically puts you, I think, in a, in, in a position to help them and to really solve the problem. Um, and then as I moved into leadership and supervisory roles, you know, we, especially in HR, we all hear this all the time, but, you know, um, people join companies and they leave bosses, right? Don't be the boss that people leave. Right. And that doesn't mean that you have to be everyone's friend and you're going to have to enforce the policies and all of that. But everything that Pamela and that Angela was talking about, you know, be authentic, know who you are, empower your people, put, you know, you know, put a hand down to help someone else come up, give an opportunity to grow and to learn. Right. You know, and, and they're going to leave. Some of them are going to leave. Right. Not everyone's going to like your management style or or maybe the company just isn't large enough to give them the opportunity that they want. Right. But make it a tough choice for them to go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think those are great, you know, pieces of advice that were given to you and hopefully everyone here, I definitely will be taking this um, and using it and then passing it on it'll be a whole cycle um we have so that is the last of the questions that i have um we have four questions from the audience and just so that we get this in time perhaps one person will answer each question um and then you know the last one it can be a little bit of free for all you guys can claw and and figure out who wants to answer that one um but the first question is when you are in a male dominated job group like IT, how do you handle inappropriate, rude or condescending coworkers? And then this um, attendee gave an example, responses to male coworkers on an email thread are responded to and handled in a much different manner than the response to a female. Yeah, I'll, I'll tackle that one first. I mean, um, I, I've been in a predominantly male um, dominated industry for most of my career. And in fact, when I joined Caliber, if I looked around, everyone in leadership was male. 
um, and actually primarily white male, right? And so, um, you know, one of the first times I walked into the executive conference room as an attendee, um, someone actually asked if, if I could go get him a cup of coffee, right? And so, um, yeah, I know, trust me. You know? And um, so, I mean, but but I, I would say, um, First of all, you use your use your resources, right? Go go to leadership within your organization, whether that's within IT or whether it's with human resources. And and I don't mean that from a you know you're trying to get someone in trouble, right? But but you know what are the resources that they can give you to help you deal with the issue if you feel comfortable address the person directly, right? Again, kindness with, you know, with a positive intent, but you know, hey, you know, Joe, did you know that when you respond this way, it can offend others? Or have you noticed that when you respond to women on these threads, it's a little bit of a different tone than you take with, 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 uh, with the males, right? I think this is one of the downsides to the pandemic and all of us being remote. You can't just pick up and walk down the hall and knock on someone's door and say, hey, you know, this is how I interpreted the message. Is that what you meant, right? So pick up the phone, right? So much gets lost in translation, right? And again, it kind of goes back to what I said of assumed positive intent. Um, and, and then, and lastly, if none of that works, then I say, you just call it out. Right. And I think that you approach it head on and you let people understand that you as a woman aren't going to allow someone to treat you um, inferior to someone else. Thank you, Laura. Um, the next question that we have is um, it says for women college students coming into the workforce without a lot of work experience, what advice do you have for them negotiating, negotiating salary, especially if they're young and starting in the workforce, which we can, we did this a little bit, but you can maybe do the bullet points because they might've missed it. Okay, I'll, I'll try to, to recall. Um, to negotiate salary, go ahead and do some research, right? So if you go online, there's a lot of different websites. There's a lot of different um, organizations that actually do salary analysis for um, particularly college students coming out or students coming out of college and going into specific careers. Use that as a basis. That's number one. Number two, understand what the cost of living is at your wherever you're trying to go, whether it's here in the Washington DC metropolitan area, or if you're trying to go to California where it's very high, um, but we're, we're starting to get up there too in this area. It's not, a, it's not cheap to live in the, the, the area here. Um, and then number three, talk to professionals in the specific field that you wanna get into and get their input. They typically have, um, some insight of the career progression and the salary that goes along with it. Um, and then I'll give one final one. I just thought about this. Use your career services organization at your school. They have that information. It's a, they, they have to have that information in order to help the students um, matriculate and get into uh, different fields of their choice. So utilize those four and you should be in a good, uh, a good spot to move forward and negotiate. Thank you, Pamela. Um, the next question that we have is, do you believe women still have to do extra or more work to get noticed? Um, this student is a graduate student who's been in the workforce for a long time, and she definitely feels that being female means you have to work twice as hard. Oh, I will take that one and I will probably say uh, unconsciously, probably yes. <laughs> Yes. I mean, again, I think uh, women professionals are perfectionists. We want to be perfectionists. We want to do it right. We want to do it better. So we're going to always want to stay two steps ahead of the the, the curve, two steps ahead of the, the game, whoever's doing it or whatever they're doing. So I, is it required? I don't, I won't think it's required, but I think it's instilled in us uh, as women, as we grow up, if you're in a positive uh, home environment, positive uh, circle of friends, of sororities, whatever you, whoever you surround yourself with, which I think is important to make sure you surround yourself with those positive role models. Not necessarily all women, just positive role models who are going to make you feel good about you and moving forward. But I think you're going to instinctively want to do better just because 
um, just because that's just our genetic makeup. <laughs> it's just our makeup. <laughs> Very true. Thank you, Angela. Um, the next question is, how can we find a mentor and a sponsor and or a sponsor? Um, how do you suggest we continue to network and foster meaningful professional relationships with professors after we graduate? Great question. Let me jump into Let me start and then I'm going to ask my, my uh, esteemed uh, <laughs> Laura and Angela to jump in on this one. I actually just spoke last week to my professor. I think I told you um, I graduated Marymount, I think it was in 91 or 92. And um, my professor, the professor that I had in one of my, it was a graduate program was Steve Steckler. And Steve Steckler is no longer obviously with the company that he actually brought me to. Um, but I actually spoke with him last week. So um, the way that I, and, and I still consider him a mentor. Um, he can't be necessarily a sponsor because he can't sponsor me at my job. He can't come in there and say, let me tell you how Pam is doing when I'm talking to her about a certain issue and how her thought process that would be really good in this other part of the organization. He can't do that. But um, the key to your mentorship is you should own it. I know it's a two-way street, but you own it, meaning that you are regularly following up with them. Even if it is a, hello, can we just have a, uh, can we want to have do coffee, a virtual coffee, obviously, right now, um, just to see how they're doing. Every, every interaction with them doesn't have to be, tell me about what I need to do next with my job. Tell me the next thing I need to do. It's, it's cultivating relationships. And that cultivation can lead to so many more things that you would have never imagined. So um, how you find them to me is in school number one, what you're doing now. And then when you get in the workplace, you're, you should continue to always watch. People are always watching you, whether you think it or not. And you're probably watching people as well. So watching how they respond to people, how they show up, um, how they are solving problems if you're sitting in meetings. And you might say, you know what, that person, Laura, the way she talks, how she's coming across, I really, really enjoy um, listening to her. I'm going to reach out to her to see if I can just have some initial conversation with her and let her know I'm looking for a mentor and why I feel as if she would be a great mentor for me. And that also, you know, hopefully will make Laura feel great. Like, wow, she's impressed with me. I love to help her. But the reality is also this, you will get something out of that mentor, having Laura as your mentor, but Laura is going to get something out of you being their mentee. All right, well, then I'll go next. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I, I think it's a perfect place to pick up because you are starting to go there, Pamela. Don't be afraid to ask, right? Don't be afraid to ask someone to be your mentor. As Pamela said, if you, if you uh, enjoy the way that someone is presenting or that you feel that what they're talking about resonates with you or you like the way they're showing up and what they're saying, don't be afraid, as Pamela said, knock on their door, send them an email, send, you know, pick up the phone and call them and ask them that, right? Um, it's a little bit also like dating, right? There's almost an intangible piece to this, right? You can't, um, you, you might, you might, you know, think that this person is going to be the perfect mentor for you, right? And then you meet them and it just doesn't work, right? So I would also say be open to your mentor can literally be anyone, right? It doesn't have to be a woman. It doesn't, they don't have to share the same color, ethnicity, where they grew up, right? It's, a, it's really amazing when you open up the possibilities of who you will find that can be your ally, be your mentor. And we've talked a lot about mentoring versus sponsors and, and, and I'm glad Pamela brought that up. And there's another one here of, of a coach, right? And so know the role that each of them will have so that you don't have unfulfilled expectations, that you're not putting unrealistic expectations on the relationship, right? Because they each do very particular things. So if you're looking for someone to build your skills gap and to navigate your journey of how you're gonna get there, you're looking for a coach, right? You want a mentor, as Pamela said, to cultivate a relationship, to talk about what's happening emotionally. How do you navigate you know, the, these difficult conversations and maybe relationships you're having? How do you dream big, right? And then that sponsor of how do you get someone 
who is going to talk about you when you're not in the room. And I love that definition. Pam, I'm going to write that down. I'm going to steal that. Right. You know, so, you know, so how, how do you find those people? And, and I would say, again, when we were talking about total compensation packages, when you join a company, look at what that professional development benefit is. So many of them have a professional network or a membership benefit. Take advantage of it, right? Whether it's with the Chamber of Commerce, whether it's with the Engineer Society, if you're an engineer, if it's SHRM, if you're an HR, right? And then go to everything they offer, right? You will meet people again of all shapes, sizes, backgrounds, career longevity, you know, people who are just on their journey along with you, people who have been there for a while and you, that network will start to build and you will naturally find that mentor. And even more importantly, I've found um, sponsors who will talk to you in the industry or talk about you in the industry. Mm -hmm. It's very important to have that sponsor in the company, but also someone who, you know, is willing to say, just, just like hair, how, how did Angela, Pamela, and I get here today to talk to all of you, mm -hmm. right? Because someone was willing to reach out to Marymount and say, hey, you should go talk to her, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know? And so again, it's just, you would be amazed at where you're going to find them. Mm -hmm. And I think last but not least is don't limit yourself to one. You don't have to have a mentor or a sponsor or a coach. You could have someone who's going to your spiritual coach, your professional coach, your relationship coach, your, your, your mentor around different things, or, you know, someone who's going to sponsor and guide you or mentor you in recruitment versus DEI versus compensation. So it doesn't have to be one person. Don't limit yourself to a person. Um, keep your, keep your options open. Uh, as, uh, as Laura and, um, Pamela stated, you know, go to, you know, join organizations, participate uh, in conferences that they offer, uh, whether they're virtual, whether they're in person, listen to what they're saying, uh, listen to their talk. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, let me see you walk the walk in addition to just talking the talk um, so that it's just, so it is a meaningful relationship. Um, it's not a marriage. And if it doesn't work out, don't, it's okay to decide, well, this might not be the right person for me after, you know, after having conversation and going on to someone else. Thank you all. Um, we do have two more questions. We got um, two more questions. So the next question, one person can answer and then we'll do the other question just so that, you know, we can wrap up in time. Um, have you noticed a change in the hiring process of new employees for interns due to COVID? Are employers more particular with who they consider? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. We had this conversation um, at Caliber. I don't know that we're more um, particular about who we're going to hire. We've really put more of the responsibility on the manager of, do you have meaningful work for someone in a remote environment, <laughs> right? Um, you know, everything was, was just so crazy as, as we all pivoted last year that we found that some of our internships, um, this is where you can hit pause on the recording, right? You know, we found that some of our interns um, kind of got lost in the shuffle, right? I mean, they were, they were literally just sitting at home, right? And then, um, you know, we figured that out and we got them engaged, right? And so, um, so again, for us, it's been more of going to the hiring managers and leaders and saying, you know, do you really have work for them this year? Because it's, um, it's just as, as, as as detrimental um, on our reputation and for the experience that the intern's going to have if we can't give them a meaningful experience. Thank you. And then the last question to wrap it up, um, this uh, student writes, are you all fabulous women okay with attendees attendees linking with you on LinkedIn so that they can slash we can continue to cultivate relationships and gain insight in your skill base. No, no, no. <laughs> we would be insulted if you didn't. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Angela. Yes, of course. Absolutely. absolutely. This is what, again, what it's all about is, again, yes. uh, networking. And you know, we have to three different, totally different industries that we're working in um, with our own set of network 
with our own network. And so being able to branch that out, by all means, reach out to all of us. I know what, I know we all are on LinkedIn. Yes. I'm gonna ask, right? I'm, like, I'm, saying, I'm not even gonna ask. I know we're all on LinkedIn. <laughs> so, and, I, and we talk about social media and I always like to be careful about social media because I want, I know there are positive platforms for social media and there's some yes. that are not. So I always say, um, new grads, be careful about the social media and what you put on social media. Don't put something on social media that you would not want an employer to see. So think about those those type of things as you, as you go through. But when we speak of, of social media, we're looking at those positive platforms, LinkedIn, um, those organizations that are professional links uh, versus a personal exchange of, of um, pictures and thoughts and stuff. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Nice. Stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure um, I can speak for everyone when I say we look forward to adding you all on LinkedIn. So keep an eye out for a dozen new people <laughs> on your network. Um, we are just about at time. Um, so I just want to thank you all so much for your time and your insight. This was really invaluable information are very valuable information. And we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy days um, after looking at all you do. We know 100% that you're so busy and we feel very appreciative um, that you took the time to chat with us today. Um, so thank you very much for that. And we look forward to connecting with you on LinkedIn. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Nice thank to meet you. everyone. Thanks yes, for my thank great you. panelists. Yeah. No, right? Nice to <laughs> meet you. We had we were a great compliment to each other, right? Yes, we were awesome. <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.